This video is brought to you by the 3 Minute Board Game Patrons. Keep us independent by supporting us on Patreon. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to this video about building a 20 game collection. So why are we doing this? Well, because recently my friend Ella did exactly that. She decided to take a step back from doing board game content and decided to really trim down her collection because, well, like a lot of people, she felt like she'd been sort of chasing games just for the sake of chasing them. So she cut down to a collection of just 20 games. And I thought to myself, wow, that's really something. That is... That is seriously making a step back from having, you know, a lot of games that you can't play. So I thought, if I was to do such a thing, which, let's just say I'm not actually planning on doing that right now because I feel in a comfortable space with the amount of games I've got. But if I was to cut down to 20 games, what would those 20 games be? And that's what this list is about today. What 20 games would I have in my perfect collection? And of course, because it's my own collection, I'm going to have to go through my own shelves and pick out the exact 20 games I want. So let's start off with the most obvious thing, my favourite game of all time. And our first pick is of course Spirit Island, my all-time favourite game. Spirit Island is a heavyweight cooperative game, and it's got a ton of replayability in it. And that's because there is a really, really good, solid core game here. And it's a core game you can futz about with a lot. There are a bunch of different spirits you can play. There's different adversaries and different scenarios, but the core gameplay itself is so very, very strong. It's also got a killer theme that I absolutely adore about nature spirits uh, whacking the crap out of colonizers. Absolutely wonderful and unique game. And I don't feel any collection of mine would be complete without it. Well, that first pick didn't really eliminate any games, but this one will. We're gonna pick a game that's both an engine builder, something I absolutely love, a game I've played a heck of a lot, and one of my favorite of all time themes, Mars. Here it is, the big bad terraforming Mars. A game I have spent way too much time playing, especially on the app, but also in person. Now I'm showing off the big box, which is one of the very few big box indulgences I've ever picked up. There's only like three or four of these in my collection. And I got it because I play Terraforming Mars that much, and I love it that much. So it's a game I really, really, really want to keep in my collection. But it's also a great engine building game. And I love engine building. It's one of my favorite things to do in a game, is to chain together a whole bunch of combos to deliver a ridiculous result at the end of the game. And very few games come close to delivering that experience, as well as Terraforming Mars. So it is my pick for my solid engine building experience. Now the thing with picking games for any collection is you have to take into account who you're going to play with. And my longest and most endearing group of players are an absolute pack of scumbags. So in order to pander to their very specific needs, I need a game that brings out the pure scumbag in them. And because my friends are awful scumbags, they enjoy nothing more than a game of Battlestar Galactica, whose original boxes sadly not survived to the present day. Battlestar is our favorite backstabbing, betrayal, intrigue, and general plotting and scheming against each other game, and we have played it a bunch. It suits our group really well, and unfortunately this one is out of print and is very difficult to get these days, but you can pick up Unfathomable, uh, which has been recently released, and that is 95% the same game with a slightly different theme. It's got an Arkham Horror theme, uh, Lovecraft theme, but I think the original is still a tighter, better experience, or more interesting experience to me, just because... You know, I like the Lovecraft theme, but I don't necessarily love it for this. Anyway, if you have a group of friends who are a bunch of backstabbing scumbags, Battlestar Galactica or Unfathomable absolutely go into a perfect collection. Now, Spirit Island is a fantastic heavyweight cooperative game, but we need a second cooperative game in this collection, and one that's a lot easier to teach. And if you're thinking pandemic, you're damn close. And of course, whenever I'm talking about a pandemic game that's better than pandemic, what I'm really talking about is Thunderbirds. Again, another game that is sadly out of print, which is a crime because I think it's the uh, Matt Lecoq, the designer of pandemic, I think it's his very best game. The reason I like this one so much is it's a perfect combination of accessibility, complexity, and intuitiveness in, in a cooperative game. 
And that's to say, it's got a lot of depth to it, but it's really easy to teach to people. And once they get the basic workings of the game and you see the little uh, lights go on and everything clicks, it's a really rewarding experience to play. And after Spirit Island, it's my favorite cooperative game. And I like cooperative gaming. Now I know there's some ever so subtle hints on the channel that my background is from Wargaming. You know, the dude who's the mascot of the channel being in a Prussian uniform for starters. That's Carl von Clausewitz if people aren't aware of that. Or the fact that I'm making a Wargame for GMT Games, Red Dust Rebellion. So I really need something in the collection that's a Wargame of some sort. Something that's a two player game that I can really get my teeth stuck into. But it doesn't necessarily need to be a real world historic game. In fact I have two candidates for this spot that are both really good games but they're both from fictional settings. Let's take a look at them. Oh, and this is a terrible choice because it's between War of the Ring and Rebellion. And the thing is, War of the Ring and Rebellion are both excellent thematic games. They're both character-driven war games and they both have a similar sort of overall feel and vibe to them. I would say War of the Ring is the better game in terms of being an actual war game, but Rebellion, I think, is a better game when it comes to storytelling. And I think that's what's going to be the difference maker here. I think I'm going to go with Rebellion because it tells the Star Wars story in a little bit more fun way than uh, War of the Ring tells the Lord of the Rings story. They're both impeccable, amazing, top-rate games that I absolutely love and would love to, to get rid of one of them. But as we're cutting down to 20 games in this perfect collection, I have to say goodbye to War of the Ring as much as it pains me and keep Rebellion, which... I think is as good as Star Wars games get and as good as sort of grand strategy games get, especially character driven ones. Um, fascinating, neat game. It's also a, a hidden movement game as well. There's a little, quite a bit of hidden movement, a lot of cat and mouse. It's a big poker game. It's a war game. Uh, it's a storytelling game. It does a lot. And for that reason alone, it stays in the collection. Plus it's a game I know people will play with me. That was literally a case of picking between two of my favorite children. An awful experience. And so I have to bow to nostalgia. I have to look at a game that I might not necessarily be playing that much anymore, but it is a game that is incredibly important to me for sentimental reasons. It's another cooperative game. It's sort of in between complexity between Thunderbirds and Spirit Island, but it's a game that I know I can get to the table. I know a lot of groups that I play with will want to play it, and it's a game that has tons of replayability. And well, it's another cooperative game. It's Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. And for those of you who don't know, Arkham Horror holds a special place in my heart, quite literally, because around about 15 years ago, uh, I was very, very sick. And that wasn't that long after Arkham Horror first came out, and was one of the few games I owned. And I spent a year um, in and out of hospital and being unable to work, and living in a really, really terrible rundown um, boarding house and literally the entertainment I had there was a computer with no internet access and a copy of Arkham Horror so I can't get rid of Arkham Horror it got me through the dark times um, and it's probably a big reason why I'm doing um, board game YouTubing right now is you know I was into board gaming back then but spending a year doing not much more than playing Arkham Horror really solidified it as my as my favorite hobby so Arkham Horror it's a great co-op as well it's a game I know I'll play with a lot of people. I have played this with a lot of people, but also I have played it several hundred times by myself. I was literally playing a game of it a day, uh, sometimes multiple games a day for nearly a year. So very few games I would have played more than Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, and there's no way I could say goodbye to it. Now, I've been focusing on an idea called game space, where games take up a specific space and you don't necessarily need a lot of games that do the same thing. When I decided between Rebellion and War of the Ring, those are two games that occupied a similar space. Now, this game appears to occupy a similar space to Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, but in many ways, it's a very, very different experience. So yeah, you might think that Arkham Horror 2nd Edition would preclude me having Arkham Horror the card game as well, but you'd be absolutely damned wrong. You see, there are two real big differences between Arkham Horror the card game and Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. The first is, I've played 2nd Edition a hell of a lot. 
Arkham Horror, I haven't played remotely near as much as I want to. You see, in New Zealand, the way they used to release this game, where they'd put out like seven packs for each module, uh, that was an absolute nightmare. Like, it, we just did not get the supply. You'd miss out on a pack. It was just super frustrating. And I'd gone through that experience with Netrunner and absolutely hated it. And it just, it got too much. It got too much to keep track of. So I fell out of um, collecting Arkham Horror the card game until they decided to repackage the game into these big boxes. Now I can actually play the game and I've got a whole bunch of cycles and a whole bunch of content I want to get through and I want to play. And I've actually been watching a lot of Arkham Horror strategy and stuff because the other thing about this game is it is a deck construction game. So it takes the spot of Magic the Gathering or Android or all those kind of deck construction games. It scratches that itch because I'm one of those people who loves playing around with deck construction. I'll sit there with a pool of cards and look at them and go, ooh, that's interesting. I reckon I can make a deck around that. And I want to do way more of that with Arkham Horror the card game. Sometimes you put a game in the collection, not only because it's a great game, but because your loved one would absolutely murder you if you didn't include their favorite game in your personal collection. Steph's favorite game is of course, Obsession, and she has impeccable taste. Obsession is a super rich thematic game. And it's also a really, really tight Euro game, and I don't necessarily think it gets enough cred for just how good a game design it is. So not only is it the super thematic experience, it's also really good gameplay. So this one probably would have made it in even if it wasn't Steph's favorite game, but I'm adding it in there absolutely 100% extra because it is her favorite game. But if you like the idea of running an English country house and you like the idea of servants and seeing them on assignments, or you just wanna play a really tight action selection game where every decision you make matters and you've only got a handful of decision points throughout the game, uh, Obsession is a really good game. So, so far this has been a thematic heavy list and I love thematic games, but there are some really good abstract games out here and we're gonna pick my absolute favorite one and add it into this collection. And of course that abstract game is Azul, a game that Steph and I also both really like. In fact, we have this really weird record of Azul where I can't beat her in a two player game and she can't beat me in a four player game. It's really, really weird. I'm not sure why it works out that way, but every time we play four player, I'll end up winning. And every time we play two player, she wins. Anyway, Azul is a beautiful looking abstract game. It's super thinky. It's got great decision points. Plus it's also quite easy to teach. So it's a game that you can teach to family members and other people who aren't necessarily veteran gamers. They won't have a shit show of winning against an experienced player, but hey, the tokens are pretty and maybe they'll have a good time as they're learning the game. Sometimes you pick a popular game to add to your collection, A, because you know it's gonna get lots of plays because people enjoy playing it, and B, just because it's so damn good. And this is one of those games, a game many people in the hobby would consider an obvious choice. And of course that would be Board Game Geek's number one game at the moment, Brass Birmingham. Now I know it's probably cool to go, ew, ew, it's a popular game, it's not very good. Brass is absolutely excellent. This is a game, because you know, I'm not big into trains or industrialization or England or anything this game is about. So I was kind of prepared to find it a bit ordinary, but it absolutely bloody hooked me. And the best thing about this one is it also hooked people who I wasn't expecting to get into it. Like the people I know who are into Euro games, they like it as well, but I have some people who don't like Euro games, but they like this because of the opportunism in it. And then the fact that they can build something and then someone else uses up their resources and that's beneficial to them. So you know, suddenly the price of iron is high, you go, well, Better build an iron mine. It's a really cool game and really interactive. Way more interactive than I was expecting. I expected this to be like dry, thoroughly German for want of a better term, but it turned out to have a bunch of flair and because of that, it's a keeper. Now, one thing we don't have at the moment is a dungeon crawler, and that is a genre I do enjoy. And it's a target-rich environment. There are a lot of good dungeon crawlers out here. And I'm probably gonna pick one that's a little surprising. And of course, that dungeon crawler is Imperial Assault. 
not what you might have been expecting. And this is another Star Wars game. So I've got multiple Arkham games and multiple Star Wars games. What's up with that? I like those things. I like Star Wars and I like uh, the Lovecraft universe. Those are two things I really like. So it makes sense that I would consider including multiple games in that theme within my very small collection. Plus, Imperial Assault is a really good dungeon crawler. Now, it's one where you need to have someone playing the dungeon master or game master or whatever you want to call it, the bad guy. But that's normally me, and I have a lot of fun doing that. Plus, I have just about all of it. Uh, I didn't get absolutely everything because of the way they sold it was completely bananas. I were like about 40 different expansions for it. But I got the big box ones. And I've only played through, I think, three of the full campaigns. So there's quite a bit more plan here. But I've replayed some of those campaigns as well. So it is a game where we have played a lot of it, but there's still a lot more to play. Uh, plus, I have painted it, and that is a big deciding factor. So wanted a dungeon crawl, I picked Imperial Assault. Now next up is an abstract game, and it's probably the simplest game on the list. Or at least it is the way we play it. I know there's a whole bunch of extra rules for this game, and there's even a co-op mode for it now. But this is absolutely a game I'm picking just because of its core, simple, basic rules, which is the only way we ever play it. And that abstract game is, of course, Santorini. A game that I hear is getting like a mega version, and I just can't fathom why. Santorini is at its best when you just play it with the basic core rules. It doesn't need any more. It's beautiful. It's elegant simplicity. It is a great two-player game with really simple rules and a ton of depth. It is absolutely chess or go-like in that regard, where absolutely simple basic rules that anyone can learn and a lifetime of gameplay. It doesn't need bells and whistles. So I would keep this. I wouldn't bother with the big deluxe bells and whistles set because all you need is the core box. In fact, you don't even really need the funky special powers in this. You just need the pieces. Uh, Santorini, wonderful game. Can't say enough good things about it. Well, we're 13 picks in and I don't have an actual war war game. And I feel like I should probably have an actual war war game. And I've got a lot to pick from, so I'm just gonna pick what I think is the best actual war game on the market. And one I know I enjoy playing and that I'd love to play more and more. And of course the war game I picked is the card driven game Paths of Glory from GMT Games. Now Paths of Glory is a card driven game. If you're familiar with Twilight Struggle it's a similar kind of idea to that. So it's not one that's heavy on logistics. It really is a grand strategy game. But what a grand strategy game. Uh, it's a game I've played through several times. I absolutely love it. And it's just got a real tense horror factor to it as well because as the allies you need to make grinding awful attacks on the western front in order to win the game it's just the way the design works you have to play the attrition game and it's horrible and you'd much rather be doing other things um, you'd much rather be fighting on other fronts against the germans but you have to keep engaging them there and i think that is an excellent part of this design and something that keeps bringing me back to paths of glory is it's a game I almost feel bad playing. Uh, I feel an element of, this is a war game, but it's also a horror of war game. Um, a wonderful experience uh, for two players, really deep, and you know, it, it's a different experience to Rebellion or War of the Ring. Uh, it's a sort of elevated experience from that, where those are very character driven and very much about telling a um, fictional story. This is a grounded game that tells a real story and yeah, a fascinating game about the First World War. A uh, war, I think, for some unknown reason, gets overlooked way too much. Not every game in the collection needs to be there because it's a serious challenge. Now, this is a game I'm putting in solely because it's a whimsical experience. And one of those games you can play with absolutely anyone. Kids, adults, heck, we played it with Steph when she was eight months pregnant. And now we're up to the wacky dexterity game, junk art and i can't say enough good things about this silly box of silly bits if you told me that one of my favorite games would be just a random block stacking game with weird shaped pieces i would have said shut up you damned idiot you don't know me at all but it is this is just joy in a box the number of times i've put this on the table and people have been i don't know about this i'm a bit cagey and then within five minutes they're like oh 
trying to balance things and getting all excited, hooting around the table and acting like a pack of gibbons. Fantastic game, fantastic party game, fantastic game for any group of people, unless you're absolute killjoy, awful, awful human beings. In which case, might not be a good fit for your collection. But if you have a soul and a good sense of humor and like silly games, junk art, absolutely brilliant. Now, one of your first thoughts about getting a perfect small collection would be to get games that you know are going to get played over and over again. But there's a little bit of majesty you lose in that. So I'm going to pick an event game. A game I know I'm not going to get to play that often still, even with a 20 game collection. But it's a game that I want to play and I want to invite a big group of people around and make a day of it. And I think just about every collection could benefit from at least one event game. Something you play once in a blue moon, but it's a special occasion when you do. There were a bunch of games that could have fit in this spot, but the one I went for in the end was June, the original game for this spot. And June is also a diplomatic game. So it's not just a dice chucker. In fact, there are no dice in June. All of the decisions in the game come down to play a decision. And it's a game where you can be absolutely screwed over and destroyed miserably through the course of the game. But that's part of the fun and part of the experience. But I think the main reason this fits in the collection is because it's a negotiation game. It's a game where you spend hours debating and planning and plotting and ultimately scheming your way to victory. Plus, I really like the June theme, especially with the new films that have come out that have breathed a bunch of life into this IP. It's a neato game and one that I definitely think would be perfect for my event game spot. And on the flip side to an event game are games that you can play with absolutely anyone. No collection is complete without something like this. And that is of course the silly little game Sushi Go Party. And what can I say about Sushi Go Party? It's light, it's fun, it's silly, it's a drafting game. Um, the reason I picked Sushi Go Party over Sushi Go itself is this does have a bunch of fiddling you can do to make the game a little bit different in case you get bored of the original gameplay. But you can still set it up exactly as you would Sushi Go. So, you know, it's a fine, fine game, but it's so casual friendly. It is so family friendly. You can play this with absolutely anyone. This is one of those games that I'm like, oh, you, you don't do board gamings. And in fact, you kind of turn your nose up at the idea of board gaming, but you kind of still want to give it a go. Well, let's try Sushi Go and see where you go from there. A um, lot of fun. Uh, it's also a good filler game. Like if you've got 15, 20 minutes uh, time to kill in a session, it's still a great little filler game there as well. So I like Sushi Go. I think it's a great part of my collection, specifically Sushi Go Party. Only four spots left and it's getting a bit tricky now. And I'm gonna do a bit of a reach pick and pick something that's a very specific interest to me. Something that I feel my collection would be incomplete without because it's a game I really enjoy playing and it's a theme I really dig space exploration. So next up is Leaving Earth, and you're probably not familiar with this box because this is a custom-made box that my friend Thomas built for me and that I airbrushed uh, lovingly, which is why it looks like a high school art project. Uh, Leaving Earth is a pretty tricky game to get these days uh, for various reasons, but if you can track it down, it is a wonderful space race game. It's really quite heavy and mathy, but that's part of the charm of it for me. It's a game about taking risks. It's a game about building a space program and just flinging people to Mars and seeing what Mars is going to be like. And sometimes Mars is terrible and you shouldn't have sent those people there and what were you thinking? Wonderful game. Um, and one of those games, we played it recently and a friend of mine hadn't played before and we played for four and a half hours and he was like, what? What do you mean we played for four and a half hours? What, what, but, but I was supposed to go like an hour and a half ago. He completely lost track of time. It's so engrossing, uh, such an engaging game. And if you are into the idea of space races, which I am, and you're into the idea of space exploration, which again, I am, Leaving Earth is my favorite in that genre. Um, and it's, it's a really neat game. And you know, I made a box for it. Look at my picture of Jupiter, isn't it grand? <sighs> Don't give up my day job, yeah. Now we've got quite a few cooperative games in the list, and that's great. I really enjoy cooperative games. 
but what we've got so far is skewing from the medium to high end of complexity. What we really need is a lightweight cooperative game. And of course, under the sea is the crew, Mission Deep Sea. Not the crew one, the crew two. Uh, make sure that it is the crew two. Not that there's anything wrong with the crew one. The crew one was my game, uh, small box game of the year a few years back. But the crew two, Mission Deep Sea, does everything the crew does just a little bit better. Uh, it's a really, it's amazing how they took an excellent game and just, you know, knocked all the little rough edges off to make it a much better game. Uh, so why is the crew two really good for a collection? Because it is a lightweight cooperative game. It's a trick-taking game. So people who have experience playing things like 500 uh, and other bridge and other trick-taking games, they might be able to get into uh, this. Even though it is quite a different experience being a cooperative game uh, to bridge or other trick-taking games. But it's also just a really fun, fun experience. And you can dial up the difficulty to whatever level is comfortable for you and your group and you can just keep playing this game over and over great lunchtime game great filler game um great game just to just to kill time with and yeah it's hard for me to say much more about the crew uh it's just a really neat game and a, i think a very important part of my very special collection only two picks to go. So I'm gonna pick games that cover a whole bunch of bases. And the first one is worker placement and adorable animals. Worker placement and animals, well, it really, it had to be Everdell, didn't it? I mean, I really like Everdell. Uh, I like playing it with just the Pillbrook expansion. That's the only one I've got. I've looked at the other expansions and I'm like, yeah, I'm really happy with it as it is. And I didn't go all in on the big collector's box. Um, Maybe I might pick that up later, but at the moment I'm really happy with Everdell plus one expansion. And uh, this is just a neat game. Uh, I really like Everdell. Um, it's a worker placement game in part. It's a sort of set collection game as well, a drafting game. There's a, there's a lot going on. Plus it's got cute animals in it and squishy berries. Plus, you know, there is a three minute board games card for it, which didn't really influence the decision that much, but it is a nice thing to go, yeah, I'll keep the game that's got me in it, because that's kind of cool. Anyway, Everdell, uh, great sort of mid-tier game. It's not a casual friendly game. It's not a family friendly game at all. Uh, I don't think it's just that little step above, but really enjoy this every time I play it. It's really well put together as well, and just a solid game experience. And yeah, I really like this version of it as well. So I've got the Collector's Edition plus Pillbrook, and I've got no real desire to get more than that. And the final game, desperately trying to bring in as many experiences as I can to close off this collection, I'm gonna go for a deck building game that's also a dudes on a map game. And yep, that last game is Tyrants of the Underdark. A uh, game that I really only discovered in the last uh, 18 months or so. But it's a really neat combination of deck building and area control. And it's been an absolute hit with every group I've played it with. So if I want to play a dudes on a map game or I want to play a deck building game, this kind of scratches both itches. A uh, really neat game. And this is the new version which has cardboard tokens. Now I know there's a version with miniatures, but I don't see the point. It just seems like it would crowd the board and make it really cumbersome. I think. It's one of those few games where I'm like, yeah, I think the streamlined version is the way to go. So yeah, Tyrants of the Underdark, the last game going into my really tiny 20 game collection. Well, that's my list. And of course it's a flawed list. And there's a whole bunch of games I really would like to have put in there on top of that, especially like my own game, Red Dust Rebellion, when that comes out. Like if I was to have a 20 game list, I wouldn't be able to have my own game. How stink would that be? Anyway, let me know in the comments what your 20 game list would be. Because honestly, 20 games is still a lot of games. And I look back at this list and I go, I've got a lot of things that cover a lot of bases and can appeal to a lot of people. I'd be quite happy to have that 20 game list. The fact is, I am excessive and have many, many more games but I'd be quite okay with just having 20 games if those were the 20 games I got to keep. What would your 20 games be? Let me know. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the notification button, like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and please come support us on Patreon.